Well, I just got that song out of my head from Bible school, so uh, <laughs> open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7. And um, as we begin, let's pray. Father, I come to you now and I trust your word and I pray that you would speak to us from your word. We, we need it, Lord. We need your word um, to um, satisfy the very longings of our soul. And so would you do that for us this morning? Lord, I, I, I preach your word now and may it go forth and accomplish all that it sets out to do and not return void. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you think heaven will be boring? I mean, logically you would say no because you know that it probably won't and it almost feels disrespectful to say that it would. But be honest with yourself for a second. Do you, with all the thoughts you've always had of what heaven is supposed to be like, do you ever think to yourself, that sounds like it might be kind of boring? The odds are your imagination of heaven is, is, is something that, that might maybe th come to be like that because you've, you, what, what you've imagined it to always be like is some really bad pop culture picture of the afterlife, whether it's the baby on a, harp, a, baby on a cloud playing a harp or whether it's just a big white expanse with nothing to do. You, everyone's in the same white clothes, nothing around, just, just white fog everywhere. Or maybe a never-ending church service that just goes on forever. And all those things sound pretty miserable to you. To, to literally do forever. Well, like We're not talking about an hour. We're not talking about a day. We're not talking about a week or a year or even a lifetime. We're not even talking about 10,000 years. We're talking about forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And maybe you think, won't we get tired of it at some point? There are things in this world that I love to do, but I have my limit. So won't I get tired of heaven eventually? We're going to talk about today the, the, the aspect of heaven that maybe you imagine you will get tired of, and that is worship. Worship is in heaven is not just an eternal church service, as you may have thought. It's the culture of heaven. To live rightly in God's presence is worship in itself. So Revelation chapter 7, we're going to see a picture of worship in heaven. We're going to start in verse 9. We're going to read through the end of the chapter. So let's read together. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and cr excuse me, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorched, scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of their throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to the springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Have you ever truly worshipped? Like, I don't mean have you ever sang loud. Or have you ever lifted your hands while you sing? Or have you ever danced or ever got butterflies from someone singing? No, have you ever stood in awe of God for something he did? H have you ever been left breathless from God himself? If you ever have, you know that when that happens, you crave more of it. You just want more of that very thing. We were created to stand in awe of beautiful and glorious things. 
It's why you cheer when an insane football play happens. It's why you gaze at a sunset and can't look away. It's why you love hearing a child's giggle. You, you, you were created to stand in awe of beautiful things and glorious things. There's a song, and I tried to get it to print this morning, but it wouldn't work, so I had to pull it up. Um, there's a song by the musician Phil Wickham um, from several years ago called Wonderful. Let me read you some of the lyrics. It's just about how God is wonderful. I can see you in the light of a new dawn. I can hear you in the words of a love song. I can, um, sorry, I got to skip. Uh, I, I, can, I can hear you in a mother's, I can see you in a mother's touch, in a father's cry, a friend who freely gives his life. He, he, he names off, I, I can see you in, a, in the brand new life of a brilliant spring, in the promises of a wedding ring. I can see your love, see your heart. Oh, how wonderful you are. So just all these different experiences of life that he can see God's beauty in. Um, see, worship is not just singing. It's not just singing. We've turned it into that because there's a whole genre on the radio called worship music, like, like the rest of the music isn't worship music, either to the Lord or to something else. Um, uh, you know, I understand worship doesn't stop when the choir comes off the stage. I'm worshiping right now as I preach. And worship doesn't stop when we do the closing prayer today. You, you do all things to the glory of God, and you allow all things to draw your attention to the God who gave you that very thing. Worship is about standing in awe of God and letting all things draw your attention and affection to him. Not just church, but when you eat a good meal, when you are with your friends, when you snuggle your child, when a cool breeze hits your face on a hot day, when you see a full moon, when you rise early and everything's quiet and there's dew on the grass. When you laugh at a joke, when, when your child gets married one day, you allow all of these things to turn your attention to the God who gives them and you praise him for it. That's what worship is. There's a symbol in this passage here. This, this, is, this passage is obviously part of the book of Revelation. It's a book of scenes and symbols that flesh out greater realities. So while this is a scene of worship that looks like a church service, it's a scene to show you the reality of heaven. In heaven, everything is always giving highest praise to God. I'm not going to get into the weeds of some of the symbols in this passage. I'd encourage you to come tonight in the next few weeks as we look at the book of Revelation. Um, but, but, but just see the scene. It's a scene of worship, and notice who's there. Verse 9, all nations are there. All nations, from people from every nation. It's a multitude so big that you can't even count everybody. And to start off... People are there from every nation, people from all nations and all generations. Um, every generation is there. There will be believers there from all ages of history. The Old Testament saints, the apostles, the early church fathers, all the giants of church history, the reformers, the missionaries, the theologians, the inconspicuous nobodies that you've never heard of will be there. Baby boomers will be there, Gen X will be there, millennials, Gen Z, and, and beyond and before. All of those people will be there. When you start accounting for it all, you recognize there will be so many people there. This will not be a small gathering and people from every nation. It parses it out in every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. Um, every type of person is going to be there. That's, that's why there's no room for any kind of racism or ethnic pride in the people of God. The world would, would love to divide between um, different races, different groups, different nationalities, whatever. The people of God don't do that. May, they want to make you pick a side between the Israeli people and the people of Gaza. Um, they want to make you see Americans as better people than those Hispanics south of us. They want to make people who speak English better than those who don't. They want to divide us between sophisticated people and undeveloped people. They're always trying to divide us into camps, but there's only two groups of people in the world, saved and lost. Both consist of people from all walks of life. If you're saved, you're among this great multitude that we see here. You're actually in this picture, in this scene. I bet you didn't know you're actually a character in the Bible at one point. Right here, you're in this great multitude if you're saved. And beside you, are people from every nation. 
America and Mexico and Canada and Brazil and Uruguay and Spain and Portugal and France and England and Germany and Romania and Iraq and Iran and Saudi Arabia and China and Japan and Russia and North and South Korea and Kenya and Egypt and all of the others in between. You have brothers and sisters in all of those places. And we will all be together there in the presence of Jesus forever and ever. We know from this passage that it's guaranteed that the gospel is going to make it to all the places of the world. That, that every nation, every literal tribe is in this multitude. The gospel is going to make it to all these places. People who study missions currently say that there's about 8.08 billion people on planet Earth. And there, of those 8.08 billion, there's about 3.44 billion people that are unreached by the gospel. It, it, it could range, what that means is it, it could range from there are no Christians in that, in that group, or, or there, there's a couple Christians, but not enough to have an evangelistic impact on the people at large. I'm fascinated by an island off of Madagascar called the uh, North Sentinel Island. You, you may have read about it or seen a YouTube video about it or something. It's a, it's a small island off the coast of Madagascar, and it's, as best we can tell, it's a primitive people who've never had contact with the outside world. Um, they, um, they, they, they still walk around in loincloths. They have sticks with spears on the end of it. Like anytime anybody's ever tried to get to this island and go make contact with them, they've either been ran off or speared to death. Every time, nobody knows much of anything about this culture on this island. And the fact of the matter is, there will be people from North Sentinel Island in heaven. And I can't wait to find out all about them. The gospel's going to get to them at some point. Because every tribe and all peoples are in this multitude. This passage guarantees they're going to be reached. But also know that means we still have a lot of work to do in missions. There are still 3.44 billion people unreached by the gospel. These, this great multitude, they're standing before God and before the Lamb. They, they worship God and the Lamb. The, the Lamb gets the same worship that God does. The Lamb in Revelation is a symbol for Jesus. He's the Lamb of God. Often in Revelation, he's pictured as an actual Lamb. Um, Jesus receives the same worship as God the Father, for it is in Jesus that we see the full beauty of God the Father. John 14, 9, he tells his disciples, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. If you want to know what God looks like, you look at Jesus. You want to know how good God is? You look at Jesus. You want to know how holy God is? Look at Jesus. You want to see God's love? Look at Jesus and stand in awe of his beauty. All these people are clothed in white robes. Verse 9, still um, clothed in white robes because they have been fully cleansed of all their sin. There will be no sin in heaven. You will never again struggle with the sin that traps you up. You, you will never again deal with pride or greed or gluttony or lust or worry or anger or anything else. It will all be cleansed from you. And they have palm branches as they stand there. Palm branches in those days represented celebration and joy. You likely think of Palm Sunday when all the people were standing along the road of Jerusalem waving palm branches as Jesus rode in. That was a practice that they did for their kings. That, well, it's on Palm Sunday, they were waving their palm branches saying, our king has come to the city. So it, it is the people of heaven in this scene crying out, this is our king. This is our king. And they cry out, salvation belongs to our God. Notice the redeemed speak of salvation here, um, but the next group doesn't. Verses 11 and 12, the angels and the four living creatures and the elders, just the, the host of heaven, essentially, um, the ones who live in heaven, um, not the people that are saved, but the angels and the people that live there, um, they, they speak a different song and they don't talk about salvation. Why? Well, because you've got it better than an angel does. People sometimes wrongly say when somebody dies, you know, they got their angel wings and that's sentimental and comforting, but it's not true. It's not true. You don't become an angel when you die. 1 Peter 1.12 actually says that angels long to look into the salvation that we have. That means angels wish they had it as good as we do. We get to experience God's mercy. We get to experience God's grace. They don't get that. So 
Not only are the people of God worshiping, um, verse 11, all of creation is worshiping. Uh, the angels, the four living creatures, the elders, um, the, the, they in a lot of ways just represent the created order. Again, I don't have time to parse out all the details come tonight, um, but, but based on Revelation, they appear to represent everything created. Every created being from stars in outer space to the ants that crawl on your kitchen counter. Every created thing worships God because that's what they were made to do. When waves crash against the rocks, they're worshiping God. When a lion roars across the African lands, he is crying out in worship to God. When a rooster crows at sunrise, he's praising the God that made that sun come up. We, we, we know from astronomy, um, as people study the stars, that stars emit a hum. Like if you could put up a microphone next to a star, you'd hear a wom, 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 wom. I submit to you that stars are singing to God when they do that. 24-7, everything in the universe is a choir of praise to the God who made it. So they cry out, what, in verse 12, all glory, all glory, all blessing, all wisdom, all thanksgiving, all honor, all power, all might be to God. God deserves all glory and honor and praise, and that's what they're giving to him. We give a lot of praise and accolades to people here on earth, but in an eternal sense, they don't deserve it. God alone deserves all glory and honor because he's good. He is holy. He is just. He is pure. He is the savior of those who do not deserve it. What wonder of the universe, what being is there in all of existence that could, um, that could even compare to 1% of God and his beauty? So join today in, in crying out with stars and waves and lions and roosters and all of created order, praising the God he, that made you, for he is worthy. Humans are the only ones created that look at God and say, no, I'm good. I'm good. This is why we know we aren't in heaven yet, because how could you possibly see God in his glory and say no? Perhaps you are here today and you're running from God, that, that you're trying to escape him. You're actively telling him, no, he is merciful. He will forgive you. You must turn from that. You must repent and come to him. He will redeem you. He will welcome you home, but you must turn to him. So after John sees this image, verse 13 and 14, he, he talks to one of the elders and he, he just asks, hey, explain this scene to me. What am I seeing? There's a conversation that they have um, for trying to figure out who these people are. And he describes them as those who have come out of the great tribulation. They are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. It's all the redeemed. It's all the saved people from the span of history from all over the world. And they've been through the great tribulation. When Revelation uses that phrase, uh, sometimes it might be referring to the last few years of history, but most of the time it's referring to just the entire span of time before Jesus comes because the church faces tribulation in all of that. People from all of history have endured the great tribulation and they come out of it redeemed, and that is what fuels the worship of the Lamb. Suffering and trial is the crucible in which your worship is formed. The, the better off you are in life, the less likely you are to worship fully. Deuteronomy 8, when the, when the people of Israel are about to enter the promised land, um, Moses is giving them kind of like a, a final sermon before they go since he can't go. And he warns them in Deuteronomy 8, you be careful. Be careful because when you get into that land, you're going to have all your needs met. You're going to have all the food in your belly. You're going to have comfortable houses. You're going to be really happy and you're going to forget God. You're going to have everything that you could ever want, and God is going to not even be on your mind. And that's what most of us have happen in here. We live in an incredibly prosperous age. I'm so grateful that we live in the, this time and in this country that we do. I'm grateful that I don't have to worry about where my lunch is going to come from. It's at home in my fridge. Um, I'm grateful that I have the resources to buy and enjoy new books all the time and, and to get a new shirt if my, if my shirt gets a hole in it. Um, I'm grateful that if I'm sick, I can go to a doctor's office and, and get medication for little to nothing. I'm grateful I have a car that allows me to drive miles away from my house to do things. Even though we talk a lot lately about how high everything has gotten, and it has, all of us are still mostly taken care of. None of us are worrying that we aren't going to have lunch today. If you are, please let me know. You can come eat at our house with us. But 
because of how well your life in the 21st century is, we, we forget how much we need God. We forget. And sometimes I think maybe he allows suffering to come in our lives to remind us of that. You need Jesus. You need him for everything. There is nothing you have that Jesus didn't give you. You don't ultimately need, you, you, you don't ultimately work for anything you have. He graciously provides it to you. You wouldn't be able to work for any of it if you were not given strength by him. But we hate suffering in our lives, don't we? We're almost offended by it. How many people have turned away from God because something bad happened to them? Why would God let this happen to me? We're so well off in our world that we are almost entitled to nothing. We almost think we're entitled to nothing bad happening to us. We can pay our way out of any trial. We, can, we, we think we can overcome anything. But sometimes God knocks us off our feet to remind us that he's still sovereign and we're not. And his taking care of us and suffering is meant to be the crucible by which our worship grows. We're always being watched over by him, and he lovingly cares for us in all things. He is the deliverer who carries us through all trial and tribulation, be it financial problems, be it health scares, be it people in our lives um, harming us, be it persecution for our faith or anything else. He will deliver us, and he will grow us in our worship through that. That's the purpose of it. So we worship. So look at verses 15 through 17, beautiful, beautiful verses, just about what that worship looks like. It's not just an eternal church service, it's an eternal fellowship. We love to celebrate, don't we? I love birthday parties, I love wedding receptions and all those things. I love cake. Um, I love the smile on people's face at those events. I love bounce houses and inflatable slides. After all the kids leave, I jump on them and have fun. Um, but, But after a couple hours of those things, I'm ready to go home and take a nap. There's an episode of Mickey Mouse that Haddon watches that's about Christmas. He watches it all year, even though it's about Christmas. But um, in the episode, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, which are the nephews of Donald and Daisy, um, they wake up and they're excited for Christmas, and they're really excited. And so they go in the kitchen, and um, they, they go in and see all the presents at the tree, and Donald Duck comes in with all this giant spread of breakfast, carrying it in, hoping not to drop it. He sets it on the plate. They come over and they devour it. They open gifts. They have a fun time. And it's such a great day. And that night, they go to their bedroom and they lay down in bed and they look out the window and they think, I wish Christmas could be every day. And then they see a shooting star. So they make that very wish. And they wake up the next morning and it's Christmas again. And they get up and they run down and they look at all the gifts and they open them up and Donald comes in with a big breakfast and, 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 and they do that again. They go to bed, they wake up, it's Christmas again. They do the whole thing, they go to bed, they wake up, it's Christmas again. It just keeps happening. After about seven days of it, all four people, Donald, Daisy, well, all five, Donald, Daisy, and the three nephews, they are out of excitement and just want it to end. So maybe you imagine that's how anything would be. Like, eventually, I'm going to get tired of of heaven, right? Well, these verses are more a picture of what worship in heaven will be like. It's a daily fellowship with Jesus. The theologian Jonathan Edwards spoke of heaven. He says, as they increase in the knowledge of God and of the works of God, the more they will see of his excellency and the more will they love him. The more they love God, the more they delight and and the, the more delight and happiness will they have in him. But it's, it's not that heaven will be exactly the same every single day, like that Christmas episode. No, it's that it will get better and better. Day one will be wonderful, and day two will be even more wonderful, and day three will be even more and more and more and more and more, and it'll just keep getting better and better. You won't get to heaven and be downloaded with all knowledge. We sometimes think that. God alone has all knowledge, and God is infinite. That is, you never grasp everything about him. So get this, you will spend all of eternity going deeper and deeper with God. You cannot know everything about him. You cannot know every part of him. You will not have that ability. So you spend all eternity getting to know him more and more and more and having deeper and deeper fellowship and friendship with him that just keeps getting better and better and better and better. Theologians have often used the phrase further up and further in further up the mountain of his beauty to see new heights, further into the mysteries of who he is, always seeing things you didn't see before. 
It, it will never get boring. It will just keep getting better and better forever and ever and ever. I can't even imagine that, but that's how it'll be. God is infinite, and we will continue to know and love more and more of him every single moment. Look at the passage. Um, We will serve him. Verse 15, we will serve Jesus. That doesn't mean we'll be his little minions doing his bidding, you know, muhahaha. No. Remember, Remember who we saw Jesus to be on earth. His disciples served him, but he served his disciples too. It's a mutual relationship of serving. We, we, we will serve him out of love for him, and he will serve us out of love for us, because that's the truest picture of what love is. We will have all our needs met in Jesus. All our needs met in Jesus. Verse um, 16, they will not hunger anymore. They won't thirst anymore. The sun won't strike them anymore, nor any scorching heat. He will shelter us in his presence. We will never hunger again. We'll never thirst again. The hot sun will not strike us anymore. It's just starting to cool off outside, you know, 10 degrees a little bit. Hopefully that's, it's not going to go back up to what it was over the summer because it was a hot summer. So think about how much just 10 degrees down has made it more comfortable outside. Think about that on a grander scale. The heat waves are never going to strike you again, it says. He will wipe away all of our tears and he'll provide everything you ever needed. And we will walk with Jesus. It's shepherd language. He says the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, which is kind of ironic since shepherds tend to take care of lambs, but the lamb is going to be the shepherd. The shepherd of our souls is going to be our shepherd forever. We will have the relationship with him that David had with the Lord in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. When Jesus is your shepherd, you don't have to want for anything because you've got everything you need. He makes me lie down in green pastures. That is, he is going to give us rest. He leads us beside still waters. He takes us to the water to drink, and we get all that we need. He restores our soul. When life has ripped our soul to shred, he restores it. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. We will know all that is good and true and righteous forever and ever, and we will give glory to him because of that. He will take care of us as the shepherd does in Psalm 23. He loves us. He will pour out his love on us for all of eternity, and we will receive it in worship and adoration. We will walk with him as Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden, and all life will be joy-filled and happy forever, always getting better and better and better and better, no end in sight. It truly is the case that no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor heart imagined what is coming. It will be anything but boring. Pray with me. Father, we long for this day. Lord, I've had good days this week, and I've had really bad days this week. We will never have that kind of week again. We will have a a, a week where Monday is good, and Tuesday is better, and Wednesday is better, and Thursday is better, and it just keeps getting better and better and better and better and better because we're in the presence of Jesus, and we're walking with Jesus, and we're worshiping Jesus, and we're fellowshipping with Jesus, and we're receiving your love poured out on us forever and ever and ever because that's the kind of God you are that you give of yourself to others. Oh, Lord, may that stir up worship in us right now. And may that lead us to deeper worship in the future. And may that make us long for the day when we will worship you purely and truly and forever. Both in singing, but also in fellowship. And in being led to the still waters and in being restored of our soul. And in walking in the paths of righteousness and so many other things. Lord, we want that day. May everything here on earth pale in comparison to that for us. And may we hunger for the day that we'll be with you. In Jesus' name, amen.